Good evening, everyone. My name is Luisa, and um, this is Fritz, my husband. Um, we are part of the staff team here at St. Paul's Shadwell, which is a great joy and pleasure to us. It's a lot of good fun. Um, we have been married uh, seven years. We met about nine years ago. We've got a little son called Johannes, who's nine months old, so I had my first Mother's Day today. Ah. And... Um, yeah, so we are going to be sharing a little bit about um, what we feel the Lord is saying about sex tonight, um, and then we'll just be talking a little bit after that, share each what really helped us um, during times of, of temptation. Now, uh, as I said a minute ago, Rich and I got together about nine years ago, <clears throat> and um, we decided to go on a date, this was our first date, and uh, Rich said, let's go to the cinema. So um, we went to the cinema, and uh, we looked at the board like you do, you know, what should we watch, and uh, Rich said, oh, there's a film with uh, Ewan McGregor, is that right? right yeah. And uh, I've heard it's going to be amazing. So we went in, we sat down, and the film started, and there was a lot of sex from the offset. And guys, I've got to say, that, is, that's, that was quite awkward. <laughs> You're on your first date, and suddenly you've got all these images in front of you, and you go, oh my gosh, where am I to look? And luckily, Rich turned to me after about 15 minutes and went, do you want to leave? <laughs> and I was like, yes, please. Um, and so we left. So yeah, guys, maybe do a little bit of a read up before you take your girlfriends on your first date to the cinema. <laughs> Otherwise, it may be quite awkward. Um, but let me pray, and then Rich will read the passage for you. Lord, thank you so much for this evening. Lord, thank you that we can come and worship you and be in your presence. Lord, thank you for your love, your faithfulness, and the freedom you bring to us. And Lord, we pray this evening that you will speak to us. In your name, amen. Oh man, fantastic. Okay, let's... Um... Fantastic, great to see you. I've been on a silent retreat all weekend, so uh, I don't know how long I'm going to talk for. I've got to be honest with you, I've not been speaking all weekend. Um, no, I promise I won't talk to too long. Yes, uh, we did leave the cinema after we'd seen too much of you and McGregor. So let's turn to one, page 1080. Before we go to our reading, which is, um, which is 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 20, first of all, I'd like to give you the context. And I think Paul sets out the context nicely for us. So if you grab a Bible and keep your Bible open, we're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians 1 to begin with, and then we'll go to our passage. Wonderful. Well, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 1. Paul calls to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother, Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul starts his letter to the Corinthians with this greeting. And it's very easy to skip over these greetings, isn't it? It's very easy to think, well, it's just a greeting and, uh, and to just miss it. Well, actually, I want to just highlight two things in this as we talk about sex tonight. And actually, I think they're helpful for us as we read through Corinthians and as we think about our lives as Christians. I'm just going to step back because the light's really in my face. There we go. So Paul says this, To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. What Paul does from the outset of this letter is establish something about the church in Corinth. He says three things. He says, you are the church of God. You are the church of God. You are God's church. As we think about sex tonight, hear those words. You are the church of God. You are God's church. He says this, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. And what he means is this, those of you who've been purified, made holy, those of you who were not clean but are now clean, sanctified in Christ. He's establishing 
a new identity for the church in Corinth. He's reminding them of who they are, sanctified in Christ. And then he goes on, and called to be his holy people. He's saying, you've got a purpose in the world. You were called to be his holy people. Church of God. Here at St. Paul's, as we think about sex tonight, and we talk that through, the first thing we want to say is this is the premise. You've been made holy in Christ. You've been sanctified. When Christ said on the cross, it is finished, he spoke that over you. And we want to start from that place. But not only that, within there is a calling to be his people. Now, if you read the letter to Corinthians, you'll find that they don't always seem to do that. What's amazing about Paul is he addresses the church in Corinth as holy and sanctified and called to be his people. And then he goes on to tell them every single way in which they're not doing that. Just a cursory glance at Corinthians and you can see some of the things they're up to. You know, all kinds of immoral behaviour. And yet Paul still addresses them as sanctified in Christ and called to be holy. Okay, let's turn to our chapter, chapter 6. Beginning at verse 12. Bearing this in mind, to the church of God, sanctified in Christ and called to be holy, Paul writes this. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. The body, however, sorry, you say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All of the sins commit, people commit are outside their bodies. But those who sin sexually sin against their own bodies. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. So we have this church in Corinth. I'm going to just move forward a little. They have this church in Corinth. And there's these popular sayings for the church in Corinth. One of them is this. Everything is permissible. I have the right to do anything. Corinth has understood the work of Jesus in their life as freeing them from other religious things, other religious laws and ways of doing things, rituals. And so now Corinth is saying, we have the right to do anything we wish. They're saying, I'm free. And we can use that freedom however we want. That's a very common and modern idea, isn't it? You know, how many times do we hear that? I'm free. I don't have anyone telling me what to do. And often when we think about the church's talk on sexuality, we think to ourselves, well, isn't the church just kind of bound up? Isn't it just kind of living in the Victorian ages? Haven't we moved on by now? I mean, we've had a whole, dec whole decades of liberation and revolution in our culture. See, Corinth and its declaration that it's got permission to do anything is actually a very common thing for us and for the world we inhabit. I'm free. So the first thing they're saying is, I'm free. The second thing they say is this, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. What this is saying is, I have needs. And although Paul's talking about the stomach and food, he's referring to their desire to have sex, their sexual needs. I have sexual needs. That's what Corinth is saying. I'm free to do whatever I want. We're not bound 
and I have sexual needs. And I need to get those needs met. That should sound familiar to you. You know, I'm free and I've got needs. It's one of the most common ideas in our culture. I don't know about you guys, I grew up with Friends, the TV show. You know, every night I got home from school and it was on, and I got home from university, it was still on, and I got home from work and it was still on, and uh, Friends seems to have gone on and on and on. But Friends is the perfect example of I'm free and I've got needs. Here you have six unfeasibly good looking people, all living in the centre of New York, probably the most expensive property they can find, yet none of them have jobs that require them to be there during the day. It's interesting, isn't it? And these six unfeasibly beautiful people with these great jobs that don't require any work are free to do what they want. And so you have a very varying degrees of that within the, the six people. You have some who just have sex all the time. And then you have some who are, who are in some form of relationship. But generally speaking, they represent the idea. I've got freedom and I've got needs. Friends, like most sitcoms, reveals one of the most common things in our culture. The interesting thing about Friends is this. It portrays the idea that sex is just about the body. And yet, within itself, it has a contradiction. If you think about the storylines, they're not actually free. You have one relationship, I've lost, I'm back. There's one relationship that goes on for eight years. They're not free. I don't think the makers of Friends meant it to happen this way. But somehow they've managed to reveal the contradiction. That on one hand, their bodies are just there to be free and have sex. But on the other hand, actually they're not free. And so you have all these relational, emotional ties going off in Friends. I think that reveals where we're at as a culture. We have needs, we think we're free. And we think we can meet those needs through our body. And we think somehow our body won't affect the rest of us. Like somehow we've separated the two off. And the reality is, most of us know that isn't true. Paul takes this saying, and he replies like this. Firstly, he says, not everything is beneficial. And then he goes on to say this, the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. Paul replies to the premises and says, yes, you are free, but it's not beneficial. And freedom that doesn't lead to benefit, benefit in your life is not really freedom. Not everything is beneficial. And the body is for the Lord, and the Lord for the body, not immorality. Well, what is Paul saying? Well, first of all, Paul's doing this. He's contradicting the idea that the body is free and of no value. What he's doing is affirming the body. He's saying, actually, the body matters. What we do with our bodies matters. God created people out of physical dust, and he created physical people. When God came to the earth, he came as a person. Jesus was a person, physical. He had physical needs. When Christ was crucified, he was crucified in his body. When Christ was resurrected, he was resurrected to a body. A body that could be touched and could eat. A body could even walk through walls. One of my lecturers says this. Christ has been resurrected to a body that's so physical that even the walls become like mist to him. That Christ is so physical. What Paul's doing is is affirming the body. He's saying the body matters. What we do of it matters. And when we use it in immorality, and by immorality that comes from the word porneia which we get the word pornography from. We're going to come back to that. But when we use it for that, we misuse the body. It does matter. Paul's affirming the body. He's saying we're physical and God made us that way. And when Jesus comes back and establishes the new heaven and the earth, guess what? You're still going to be a body. It's still going to matter. It's going to be a body that can walk through walls, which I'm, you know, I'm personally quite excited about. He affirms that. And then he affirms this. Christ has united himself to the body. 
When Christ saved you, when you invited Jesus into your life, you invited the Holy Spirit to come into you. And you did that, most likely, as a body. You didn't do that separate from your body, did you? You invited Christ with this body to come into you. And Paul says this, Christ united himself to you. He sanctified you and made you, called you to be holy. Christ unites himself to the body. He's called us to a holy lifestyle. He's sanctified us in these bodies, these matter. And because the body matters, what we do with it matters. I live in this, this shell. It's more than a shell, it's all of me. And I go around and I proclaim the kingdom of God with it. And when I welcome people, I welcome people with this body. This is me, the spirit of God living in me. But that means this. When I'm tempted to live outside of the plan of God, I take that with me and live outside of the plan of God. Which means this. When we look at pornography... And let's just get down to it. When we look at pornography, what we're doing is this. We're taking our bodies, which have been united with Christ, and we're trying to live outside of the plan of God. It's called sin. What we're doing, actually, is denying who we are. We're denying the sanctifying work of Christ that's happened in our lives. It's not that, it's not that we're suggesting you don't have a good time. It's that we're saying that's not how to have a good time. That's not how to get your needs met. Needs are met in Jesus. When Christ united himself to you, he met your need. He sanctified you and called you to something. He changed your identity. Pornography, sex outside of marriage, sex with people we don't know, know, any kind of sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage is us trying to find our needs met where they're not supposed to be met. Because we have a need. That's true. Paul doesn't deny the premise. But he says the need is met in Christ when he unites himself to your body. He meets that need. He says you're sanctified. This is your identity. And you're changed. You're called to be holy. So, what happens when you find yourself late at night looking at porn? or you find yourself back in that person's bed, or you find yourself going too far with your girlfriend, fiancé, or the, you know, your work colleague, is a wandering away from your true identity. What's happening is you're doing something that's actually below who you're called to be. Because you are sanctified in Christ and called to be holy. I just want to leave you with a question, and then I'm going to hand over to Louisa. Louisa is going to talk about how sex happens in the covenant, of mar- covenant with God and with marriage. My question is this: a good question to ask ourselves when, and we're going to give, we're going to, Louisa and I are going to give some some tools that have been helpful to us. But a good question to ask yourself is this: Does it work? You know, when you're tempted to find that need you have met in something apart from God, does it work? What's the lie there? Because sexual immorality, porn, you know, sleeping with people we're not married to, what that is, is a lie. It's offering you what only Christ can give you. In covenant. Louisa. Thank you. Right. I'll um, try and follow that. Now, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I really, really love to do is watch a good old chick flick. How, is any, anyone in here like a chi- chick flick? Good chick flick. <laughs> oh, yes. You know, boy meets girl, they fall in love. They realize that there's this big obstacle that means they can't be together and they overcome it and then they live happily ever after. It's beautiful. I love it. I mean, I watch tick flicks. I watch them again and again and again to the extent where Rich goes, 
He said, why are you watching this rubbish? I mean, the storyline is dull and predictable. I mean, what is, the, what is the attraction here? The thing is, I don't watch the chick flicks for the, you know, exciting storyline. I watch chick flicks because I can relate to the characters. I can relate to that, that longing to, to be loved, to be adored, to find that one person. You know, we all have that longing within us, don't we, to like be sought out. The issue I have with chick flicks isn't with the storyline. It's with um, one of the messages that I think it has created over time. And it's this, that if you then love each other, you know, you meet, you love each other, and then it's fine for you guys to have sex. In fact, you probably should, just to find out whether you're sexually compatible. I mean, has any of you ever heard that? Oh, well, um, how can you not have sex before marriage? How do you know that you are not sexually compatible? And the thing is, when you have this thing of, um, you know, if we love one another enough, it's fine to have sex. Actually, what you're doing is you are making your body into a bargaining chip. Your body becomes something where if you love me enough, if I feel loved enough by you, then we can have sex. The problem with that, of course, is that our bodies, like Richard just said, is not ours to bargain with. It's not ours to give away. It says in the text we read today, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are no longer your own. You were bought at a price. Jesus bought you at a price. Now, you may be sat there thinking, but Louisa, you just said that you can really relate to that need to feel loved, to feel desired, to feel adored. And trust me, I can. But the thing I've realized is that that need cannot be met by sex. And that need cannot be fulfilled by rich. Does he make me feel loved? Yes. Does he make me feel adored and special? Yes, he does. But he cannot fill that need for my, that identity need to feel loved and secure. Um, <clears throat> Timothy Keller, who um, wrote the uh, meaning of marriage, which is sort of the basis for this course, also um, wrote this book called The King's Cross, and he puts it amazingly, because he says this. Obviously, there are healthy people and unhealthy people, but nobody can give anyone else the kind or amount of love they're starved for. In the end, we are all alike, groping for true love, incapable of fully giving it. What we need is someone to love us who doesn't need us at all. Someone who loves us radically, unconditionally, vulnerably. Someone who loves us just for our sake. If we receive that kind of love, that would so assure us of our value, it would so fill us up that maybe we could start to give love like that too. Who can give love with no need? Jesus. Only Jesus can fulfill that need within us. Only Jesus gave everything, gave himself, so that we can have relationship with God, so that we can have that identity of a, love, of a beloved child. So, where does sex fit in then? What is sex? When can we have sex? I believe that sex is a celebration of the covenant that we each have 
with God and the marriage covenant we have with one another. So let's unpack that a little bit. Only when we are in covenant with God, only when we know just how much we love, we are loved, can we love someone else. And in that love, we can be loved in return and we can have that commitment in marriage. And when we have that commitment in marriage, we celebrate that unity that we have with God and that we have with one another through sex. The thing is that when we have sex outside marriage, it becomes about us. It becomes about having that, that need for love affirmed. It becomes about performance, about making sure that you are uh, sexually compatible. It becomes a strive. But when sex is within the boundaries of marriage, it is the most amazing thing because it is a celebration of our identity in God and in our identity with one another in marriage. And so, um, <clears throat> and so that's how we, um, that's how we love each other, that's how we live. Now some of you are probably um, sat there thinking, well, you know what? I hear what you're saying. I, I get it, you know. Sex is a celebration. Yeah, that's great. Because in, we live in a culture where, as Rich earlier said, actually sex is celebrated as the one thing. We celebrate sex in our culture, but actually sex wasn't meant to be celebrated in itself. Sex was meant to be the celebration of that loving relationship. And you're probably sat there thinking, well, I get it. You know, I, can, I hear what you're saying, but actually, how do I live that out? How does that work? How, what do I do when I feel tempted? I know that I'm a child of God, but the pull is extraordinary. And I think what we want to do now is just share the things that really has helped us and still are helping us when we are struggling with sin in our lives. And so Rich is going to come out now and, um, and just share the first thing. Yeah. So the first thing... I solved it. <laughs> what a genius. Um, so, let's always never blame the technical person when it's your own fault. Um, <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, so, the first thing I want to say is this run away. Okay? So, Paul says this in his letter to the Corinthians flee immorality, run away from it. James says in his letter, flee temptation. And Joseph, when propositioned by the very beautiful Potiphar, runs away. The first thing I want to say about how we can handle sexual temptation is this. Run away. And what I mean is this. Don't see how far you can be tempted. Because you can always be tempted too far. What I mean is, is when we were going out, sometimes you, you play a game where you see how far you can go before it's too far. The problem with that game is the only time you know it's too far is when it's too far. The time to start going from that person's room is the time when you're not over the line. Run away. You know, turn off your internet, guys and girls. Turn off your internet when it's late at night. Put your laptops away. Don't look at the TV. The simplest way to avoid temptation is to run as fast as you can from temptation. Do 
Yes, I can do. Um, yeah, I think the other thing is, um, <clears throat> I think one of the thing, uh, things about sin and, and sexual sin in particular is it can become a, a circle of, and, and you just feel as though you get stuck in a circle in a certain way of living or a certain way of doing stuff. Now, um, some years ago, I found that I had got stuck in a, in a cycle of, of doing something that just wasn't right, that wasn't honoring, that wasn't my identity. And, um, and I found that I just couldn't break it. I just felt really, really stuck. And it was something that I wouldn't tell anyone. I was deeply, deeply ashamed. I didn't want to tell, honestly, I didn't want to tell anyone. And, um, and I heard a, a talk once and they said, you know what you need to do? You need to go to your accountability partner and you need to confess. You need to tell them. You need to get it into the light. You need to, you know, talk to them about this. And I thought, man, I could never tell anyone. I, I, I just don't want to. But eventually I thought, you know, that I can't live this way. I have got to get it into the light. And I, I went to um, a very good friend of mine um, <clears throat> who was my prayer partner. And, um, and I, I confessed to her. And, um, and, and she prayed for me. And I have to say, guys, getting it out in the light and getting somebody praying with you, getting somebody to stand with you is the only way. You may think, you know, this is, I mean, I am the only one struggling with this. I don't, you know, it would be so embarrassing. I, how can I tell anyone? The truth is, it says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. We all struggle with this. Rich and I struggled with sexual temptation before we got married. But you need to put it into the light. You need to get people alongside you who can pray for you, who you can ring when you're like, oh my gosh, I, I need help. Ring them. If it's 10 o'clock at night, who cares? Ring them. Pray together. It's important that you have somebody to stand with you. Fantastic. And the final thing we want to share, just in terms of a tool, is something we call, uh, you may have heard of it, it's called HALT, Hungry, Angry, Lonely, Tired. Say after me, Hungry, Angry, Lonely, Tired. Okay, and it's just really simple. It works as just a warning system. And uh, it's like this. If I'm hungry, I'm more tempted. If I'm angry, I'm more tempted. If I'm lonely, I'm more tempted. And if I'm tired, I'm more tempted. And, and we use those as, as kind of warning lights for us in our lives. Most of us, some of the time, we have hunger. You know, we get hungry. We get, sometimes we get angry about stuff. That's fine. But what we do is we look to see how many warning lights we have on in our lives. So, you know, sometimes that happens and it goes away. You know, it's been a long day. I'm tired. But what we need to watch for is when it's been a long day and then it's a long week and then it's been a long month and a long year and then suddenly it feels like it's been a long life. And that warning light's on. And actually we're hungry. And I don't just mean hungry for food. I mean we're hungry for affirmation. Most, we talked a lot about need tonight. We need affirmation. When we're hungry, and again, over time, when that light's been on for a while, when there's two of them, we need to start asking ourselves, actually, do I have a problem here? It's like you don't ignore the warning light on your car. Well, you, you can do, but you will regret it. And it's the same sort of system. You don't ignore red lights unless you, you know, drive in London. And, um, you know, am I lonely? You know, do I have friends? Do I have people who say, how are you doing? Sometimes we need someone to speak over our lives. You don't have to live that way. Am I lonely? Have I been lonely for a long time? Is there a warning light on my life? Am I angry? You know, sometimes we're angry about stuff we've forgotten we were angry about. And it lies in the back there. 
They're warning lights. And the danger is that we, we seek, when we're not aware of that, what we do is we seek to have those warning lights switched off, the need met in the wrong way. I'm training for the mouth at the moment, which um, is, I think is probably a mistake. And um, today I do anyway. And often I'll be running and I'll be out running and I'll start to think about all the things I'm going to eat when I get back because that's how I'm getting home. Okay, so yesterday I was out running. I was on a silent retreat. So what do you do when you go on a silent retreat? You run. And so um, that's the answer. So I, I was running and I was in Leicestershire and... Um, I thought I'll buy some Lucasailer stuff while I'm out. That was my first mistake. So I got to the 10 mile point where I was going to turn around and I met this lovely lady and I said, you know, do you have a shop here? She looked at me as though that was the most ridiculous question anyone had ever asked her. And she said, the nearest, question, the nearest shop is four and a half miles away. So at this point, I'd been running for 10 miles up and down hills. I was so hungry. All I could think about was how much food I was going to eat when I got back. And they ran four and a half miles back, got to this village, shop was closed. It was a nightmare. I was like, praise the Lord, the shop. Oh no, the shop's closed. Uh, kept running. Went to a pub, just down the Coke. Just like, down the Coke, loads of bad stuff. Just, it was totally the wrong thing to get me home. Then I had to run another seven miles or something because I got lost. Uh, got home, just ate so much chocolate. That's not going to get me through a marathon. <laughs> That's called responding to the need because I've not thought it through properly. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. How many of those lights do you have on your life? How many have you had on? The time to, when those are on, on a long-term basis, that's when you need to stop being accountable. But when they're on at the end, on a Friday night, that's when you need to just think, stop. I don't want to get myself in that situation. I'm not going to turn my laptop on right now. I'm, I've got these warning lights on. I'm not going to go around to the house tonight. I'm, we're not going to go... We're not going to go and watch a movie in, our, in, our, in your room tonight because I've got all my warning lights on. I've got two of them on and, you know, it's just going to end badly. Hungry, let's do it together. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Wonderful, well done. Why don't we stand?